All right. I'm going to get set up here and make sure the sound is good. And uh, we'll get here started in a minute. Uh, looks like we've only got one person here so far. All videos start that way before we get a lot more. Looks like Sheila Bar Barrera. Uh, <clears throat> welcome to the channel. Hey, DD, how are you? I see you in our chat as well. Uh, welcome. So, guys, looks like we've only got one or two here just so far. So, we're going to do some introductions. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am the owner of Section8Consulting.com. I am well known uh, on YouTube as well as uh, on Google. Uh, matter of fact, I was doing a search today, and they uh, it appears that Google, a lot of people Google the Section 8 man, so it seems that I might be um, becoming popular for that particular name, uh, much to my surprise. So, uh, Major Media Productions, hey man, glad to have you here. Anytime we got some good media, big and small. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people want to know, hey man, what gives you the right uh, to give people advice about Section 8? What makes you so good and, and other people's not so good? Where, where do you derive what you do? Is it passion? Is it just a job to you? Or is it just about money? So today I'm going to tell you all a story. Uh, whether you find it compelling or not, uh, it's going to be an interesting one. And it's going to be a hell of a ride. Uh, so get ready. Uh, this will be a long one. Look, you don't have to watch the whole video. You can always pause it, come back to it. Y'all know I can talk for an hour. And this will definitely, it's a story. It's intended to go for a while. Um, so <clears throat> before uh, I ever own a big home and, uh, make the money that I do, um, uh, when I was younger, a kid, uh, I ended up on the streets, you know, like many of you that struggle with housing and those of you that have already been made homeless or by virtue of this pandemic have been put out your homes to live, uh, you might know what it means to be homeless, whether you're sleeping in a car, homeless shelter and other places. I took a, a big chunk of my life, you know, as a kid, you don't know what you're supposed to know. And when you're out there, um, you could spend a long time trying to figure it out. It's been a decade uh, out there. And what makes my story a little bit different than others is eventually through uh, that adversity, um, I became angry about how just how hard it was to get housing and how convoluted. Y'all know I love that word a lot. Um, and through that process, I used what the little that God had given me inside this head of mine, uh, to do an extraordinary amount of research and spend a lifetime trying to unravel it all. I reached that point a long time ago where that light bulb goes off and you say to yourself, I, okay, now I know, now I know that I'm actually producing something for people that actually help them. I know that I'm better at this than those that actually created and designed the system. And I am highly effective at getting people what they need, you know, but if it wasn't for that part of my life, say I had just been some old white dude. <laughs> okay. That had never suffered a day's moment in life. Had I never reached the, the street, I might not be sitting here today. I might be sitting in some office, not helping anybody, but myself, the center of my own world with a focus on a new iPhone, a new car, and a pretty home. But life didn't go that direction for me. So let's tell you about the story. <laughs> and see if y'all see whether or not you believe it or not, okay? Over those 10 years, uh, between 16 and 26, uh, I traveled across 22 states. Um, and I had to keep notes here because it's hard to recode that kind of information from 25 years ago. And during that 22, year, uh, 22 states, I uh, lived in 13 major cities. My total adventure time was around 8,400 miles. It means I literally went around the country more than twice. Um, Y'all also learned the purposes and reasons why I support and aid cats. Y'all know that I'm a cat lover and I rescue them a lot. There is a very compelling reason behind that. And I think as I tell you the story, you'll begin to understand why I care so much about them and why I rescue them and why I dedicate such a large part of any money that I get towards that. Um, and of course, that's not just cats, uh, anything that I can help, you know, people, humans, dogs, cats. So I'm going to give you a rundown real quick. And uh, it took me a while to reco a lot. And so the story will jump all over a little bit because I'm still 
you know, in those days I drank too, you know, living on the streets. There's a reason why people get high and drunk. Okay. I didn't get high, but, uh, I definitely drank and I drank till lights out. Uh, let me tell you, living out there is not, is not a joke. Uh, and those that have survived that, no. And, uh, 10, 10 years, long time. So, uh, I left, I grew up, uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And, uh, I didn't know it as a kid, we were, we were poor, very poor. We lived in a trailer park. Kids didn't wear shoes. That was back in the days when you could walk into a store, you didn't have to wear a shirt. Okay. I lived in South Louisiana. That's how shit went. It'd be a lot like probably looking at some of the families that live in the backwoods of Virginia. Uh, you know, so we didn't have much people drink and did all kinds of things. <laughs> so when I left there, I'm, I, uh, one day it just occurred to me, man, I went down to the uh, Greyhound and I uh, said I'd had enough of everything and I figured that the world had something more to offer me. So I got on a Greyhound and I had no worldly idea where I was going to go. So I took it to New Orleans. I spent about a month out there. Uh, I lived in an abandoned apartment complex and, uh, you know, did my thing out there in the Bourbon Street and all that and just kind of enjoyed life. See, I had a switch in the brain that most people don't have. And that's the ability to turn off whether or not I cared about being homeless and whether I had something to lose. If you can flip that switch, you could do what I've done that 10 years. Maybe that makes me a bit of a psychopath. <laughs> but yes, I did have a switch that I could literally turn off in my mind pretty much. Maybe I was designed that way. And so I spent that time in yours for about a month, enjoyed that. And then I thought to myself, well, hell, this isn't so hard. Okay. And I want you to mind one thing. I wasn't staying in a homeless shelter. I wasn't picking up bologna sandwiches and sleeping on the mat. I was sleeping quite literally uh, as homeless. Okay. I loved there and uh, I took another Greyhound, went up to Lake Charles, Louisiana. This is me getting comfortable with the idea of leaving the state of Louisiana, my territorial uh, grounds. I stayed there for about a month with a drug addict. I ne uh, nearly became uh, involved in cocaine because of that. All right. Uh, but I did not. Uh, I chose to, to opt out of that because I didn't need to make my situation more complicated than it was. And so I'll leave that story as where it stands. From there, uh, I decided I wanted to make my first trip to the big city. So I hopped another Greyhound and I went down to Houston, Texas, where I had ventured across the state of Texas. I see you guys are commenting down there. I'm going to get to that in just a second. Uh, I spent uh, a little, uh, I think about three months in Houston. I went up to San Antonio, went to Austin, went to uh, El Paso as well. So I went to check out all the cities. I did so, and I even bartended a few bars, but uh, the owners had no idea that I was homeless at the time. And I focused my attention at that time in uh, Texas and staying at Union Missions and Union Gospels, uh, homeless shelters. Always look for those names. You don't really want to stay at a Salvation Army and other ones because the religious ones were always better for some reason. And over time, as you evolve as a homeless person, you start to figure out what's easier and what's harder. So I utilize that system very well through the state of Texas. So I'm going to take on a few comments here and take a look, see what people are saying. I'm buffering heavy and on my end. I'm sorry to hear that, major media. It says, Sheila Barbera says, will housing uh, referral from an attorney be the Texas Advocate Project be beneficial for my application? Well, uh, attorneys don't carry any weight whatsoever. So, I mean, attorney is like a doctor. Uh, they can recommend all kinds of shit. It doesn't mean anything. The only time a refer referral carries weight is when it's from the U.S. District Attorney's Office, when it's from uh, the District Attorney of the state or the District Attorneys of the county. The other people that carry weight are people that are officials for the county, the state, and the feds. Those are the referrals that matter. Uh, of course, you know, any letter explaining things in such a way might be a little bit of help to you. So, um, Erica M. Cross, welcome to the channel. Gail Resources, welcome. Uh, Felicia Cooley, hey. So let's move back to the story. So, you know, we're at about nine months, man. I'm traveling across Louisiana homeless. At that point, I start to gain my uh, my gravity of what I want to do. And, th and thus starts the 10-year adventure, you know. So I left there, and like I said, I went up into Houston, and I visited all the major cities and uh, earned a little money here and there. Back in those days, Craigslist, you know, you could spend your days at a library. So you notice I always focus my attention on large cities because they had libraries that were open most of the day, which had internet, which in turn had Craigslist, which means that I could have found work. So I wasn't stupid. I wasn't like, I won't say stupid. I, I wasn't the kind that was going to sit on the bridge all day and smoke crack and mouth. Uh, I was more interested in the journey than I was the, into just giving up on life. So that, that did 
definitely differentiate me from other people out there that just simply said fuck it and gave up. Uh, after that, I shot up to Oklahoma, was there for about a month, um, left Oklahoma and went to Jackson, Mississippi, got arrested three different times by the same uh, police officer. Uh, I think she was trying to help me because she never charged me with anything. She just kept dragging me to jail. It was like catch and release. I think she was just letting me know that maybe Jackson wasn't going to be the place for me. And so I ended up leaving. I'll tell you an interesting story about Jackson. And there's going to be lots of interesting stories, but I'm going to try to keep them clean because some things that happen on the street are not so nice. A minivan starts following me, okay? I just get out the Greyhound and then Jackson, the minivan with some uh, dude in it. So you can all use your imagination. He wasn't there to offer me a place to stay. I got my first proposition uh, for prostitution, okay? And though a being tempting offer to accept money when you don't have any, I, I graciously just pass. And that did freak me out a little bit. You know, when you're that young, um, you have to watch out. You can easily become a victim to other people, okay? You don't know a lot about life when you're as young as I was then. And uh, some people find that attractive, and they will take advantage of you if you allow them to do so. So I spent about a month out there, same thing, working around the cities, doing what I could, and then I moved on. So the story does actually get more interesting as we get further into this, because this is only the beginning. Uh, it gets much more sophisticated. Uh, I ended up landing in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I ended up staying at a Union Mission in Atlanta, and um, only briefly. I actually lived in an abandoned house. It was a pile of clothes, and I managed to get the gas working, probably not legally, okay? And so all I had was that, and then I could see the city of Atlanta in the background because Atlanta, parts of it's very hilly. And so I'm, while I'm in this abandoned house, you could almost say it was a crack house, I mean, almost literally, but nobody was there uh, other than uh, the fact there was a lot of dog shit in that house, and I remember it smelling bad. So I stayed there, and then I would walk uh, 45 minutes to an hour into the city of Atlanta to go to the uh, Atlanta Union Mission and uh, get food, which was terrible. And I eventually got food poisoning, and it, it, it kind of terminated the trip early because I became so ill I almost died. Um, it was a very it was a that was probably one of the more trying times of uh, being homeless. When you become sick, and you don't there's no support system in place, it gets pretty bad out there. From there, I went to Memphis. Memphis was a wild ride, okay? Left Atlanta, uh, caught um, Amtrak, I believe, up into Memphis. Man, uh, that's when I had my first experience with a psychiatric hospital, but not for the reasons you're thinking. You see, you learn a lot of things out there when you're on the street, and one of the things that I learned was in a situation, and you're so bad off where you've lost everything, all everything's been stolen from you, you're out of money, it does occur to you that if you were to possibly act deranged, that you would get a free week's uh, visit at a psychiatric facility that has what? Food, shower, clothing. And that's where I had my first experience with Section 8. That's when I first heard of, okay, well, there's a caseworker, there's a social worker, they want to help me get housing. And then I learned just how much of it was really bullshit. I remember how difficult it was to get anything done, how how it seemed that everybody wanted you to connect you to something, but nobody actually wanted to do any of the work. And so it made my visit to Memphis, Tennessee miserable. On top of the fact that Memphis already has the, the part of town where the shelters are and, and being homeless there was a hugely criminalized area. People just wanted to do the wrong things in that area of Memphis. So it was no joke being there. <clears throat> and of course, I'm a Caucasian guy living in a in a neighborhood where everybody's predominantly African American. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was uh, the neighborhood was killer, <laughs> and I was having a rough make of that one, man. But that's where I, like I said, through that psychiatric visit, which helped me kind of get rested up. And I learned about it, and I remember being frustrated about that, and I decided myself, well, you know what? If she's telling me that these things exist, then why don't I investigate it? And that became, that became part of the journey, uh, was to learn everything there was about that. And let me tell you, I'm one of those people that will exhaustively read and research things to the finest point. I'll take it to an extreme. Uh, it'll, it'll completely engulf my life. And so you see, that's 
part of how I ended up where I, you know, am uh, today. You know, I didn't go from the street to a four bedroom home. Okay. <laughs> it took a long time. So I'm answer a few questions real quick. Um, looks like, uh, anyways, backward. Hey, 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 listen here. I'm going to cut off the cat treats. You'll keep that up. Okay, I'm sorry. When you've got two female cats, uh, it's about one of them Siamese. They uh, sometimes have to get territorial, and a five foot strip of carpet could be the 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 battleground. Trust me. When you've got twenty two cats and you're trying to rescue and help them, you have to keep the nominating ones away from the, the the older ones because it ends up being bad. So what it is, my fifteen year old female cat. She's a dominant, and but so is my Siamese, which is young, and she likes to box quite literally with her paws. She'll she'll wait at the door, and as the procession of cats come into my home, she'll put out her little paw and pop them in the head. It's just a light bump, but it's enough to get everybody in line. So that's all that cat noise you just heard, and we we get that a lot around my house. It's it's quite it's quite it's kind of like having popcorn. Even when I'm sleeping, sometimes battles take uh, place around my feet, on my head. You never know. Anyways, back to the good old story. Um, so in, in Memphis, I went through all that stuff, ended up in psychiatric facility by my own purpose. I don't have any mental problems, okay? I just utilize that as a form of housing. Now, I'm not suggesting those of you that are on the street or facing housing do that. However, I did learn there is a back door through psychiatric facilities. As what by virtue, if you do get a visit there, they will and are forced because they are. If you get to the ones that are a state hospital, say it's the Memphis State Hospital, um, they would have to afford you an opportunity of getting housing. I'm not saying it's going to go well every time, but they can't just simply uh, catch and release you. You see my point? So after I left Memphis, uh, I went up to Denver, Colorado. Now, that was a wild time there. Uh, first thing I learned is at 7,000 feet, a southerner cannot breathe. It's like us trying to breathe underwater. Look, the altitudes compress the nitrogen in your blood, and you feel like you're sick all the time. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in Denver feeling like I was trying to breathe through a comforter. Um I remain not so homeless there because I ended up picking up three jobs working at bars. And then at the same time, I was steadily seeing if I could drink myself to death because Denver had a very interesting rule. When you work in bars in Denver, at least back in those days, it allowed you, all the bar owners, no matter where you work, would allow you to drink as much alcohol, beer or shots, um, so long as you weren't giving it to another customer. And so it set me up pretty badly uh, to become an alcoholic uh, because when you sit in a bar and you're told, hey, you know, part of the perk of the job is you can have as many shots or beers as you'd like. We don't really have a problem with that, but, that you know, you tell you drink 22 shots and get ripped at the bar. So anyways, I was working in those bars and I was living out of Chesman Park, which is centralized. Chesman Park was an interesting place because you had families on one side. You had gay, gay folks uh, towards the back, which... And also, Chesman Park allowed people to be completely naked, and there was no law against that. One of the more bizarre parks I'd been to, but the point of it was you could stay there if you wanted to. And so I did, a lot. Uh, when I finally started making income from bars, um, <laughs> wasn't drinking it away, I occasionally stayed at my patrons' homes. In other words, customers. Uh, they often frequently uh, would offer up their home in different things. So it was quite a wild ride. I don't think it was there about nine months before... It was time to go again, you know. I just could not sit still. So, yeah, that was a crazy time for me. Um, leaving Denver, I shot up to Chicago, even more interesting. So I get there, no place to go. Uh, I actually took, uh, I think it was Amtrak down there. Um, and so I ended up taking a job at a bar, okay? I had no place to stay. And the winter rolled around, and uh, I damn near died on the sidewalk. I didn't understand what cold was. When you grew up in Louisiana, we call coal about 92, you know, Christmas Day in Chicago. It's not a joke. Um, you know, at night, you can literally die out there. I am concerned about anybody that lives out in Chicago, New York, and all that because y'all's winners. Um, so I was staying right by Wrigley Field, uh, and um, I panhandled and uh, did a lot of things out there that were just absurd. But I stayed quite a while. Um and I, I'm intentionally skipping some of the worst parts here because I don't think it's appropriate for YouTube, okay? It's it's 
there's so much more that could be said, you know, but I just don't think, I don't think it needs to be said. Uh, I just, you know, I'm just trying to give y'all a, a walk through. <laughs> uh, so with Chicago, um, I, I, I enjoyed the state. I really did. Um, but it was a miserable place to be during the winter. And I realized I was risking my life by doing so. And then I eventually decided that it would be wise to leave. Now, you notice something that I did not go any further east. Look, I might have been homeless and I might have been traveling around the country. And at that point, by Chicago, by that at that point, I'd already been out for three years crossing the nation. So I looked at New York, Jersey, and all that. Look, I already knew shit was going to be bad over there. Too many homeless. I tried to intentionally avoid. I wanted to go to major cities, but I did not want to go where I knew that it was bad and there you if I need absolutely needed assistance, I couldn't get it. So that's um after leaving there, let's see, I went up to Seattle, Washington. So I went to almost at a uh, Canadian border, okay? I enjoyed that city immensely. Uh, it isn't really cold. It's not really hot. It's not really, it rains a lot, but it's not the kind of rain you're used to. It's a misty rain. It's not like a thunderstorm or a, a good summer's rain. It's always just misty. Um, here's the strange part. I worked with, <laughs> I worked at a private college club. That's uh a club where people had professional degrees. There's a whole toll on top for obvious reasons. These professionals, for some reason, like hookers, and I worked in the restaurant part of it. Uh, what they didn't know is I was actually sleeping in the table closet uh, the whole time. And the job was good because they had dry cleaning service. So you know that I had everything dry clean. My socks were being dry cleaned. Uh, so, and then I had access to the kitchen. So when I knew when the chef left, it was dinner time. So it was an ideal situation. I actually deployed that technique technique in many cities. So you see the point. I was being smart about being homeless. I always targeted specific types of jobs because I knew there was either food or alcohol involved uh, or the ability to wash clothes, or I knew that the operation was so large that I could find other ways to stay there as a homeless person. So I survived quite a while till they finally caught me, and then it was game, it was time, you know, game up, um, and it was sad. I did make a generous amount of money back in those days, actually. Um, I made around 900 a week, which was absurd. That was a long time ago. Um, I was very good at that place, but I uh, never could manage to fathom the idea of just go renting a, a place to live. But my most interesting, leaving from Seattle, I went down to Portland for a while. That was interesting, hanging out at the hippie bars. They got a lot of little bars out there. Um, panhandled right on the sidewalk, sit down just with the rest of them. Um, but I, I couldn't survive that city either. It was just too much going on, and I could not get anywhere. I went through social services and everything and all over there. And, of course, at that time, I had gotten a lot better. So it, I think at the Oregon stop, I was probably five years in. And uh, at that point, I had spent a great deal of my, uh, time reading legal research, case law, and then I had at that point also discovered policy and procedures. So I understood that there was a... I had already figured out that, okay, so Section 8 is run by HUD, but who the hell is giving the manuals to determine what happens with people when they apply? These are the kind of things I was thinking about all day. What else do you got to do? You can sit in the park and get a tan, okay, or you could stand at the corner and collect change, or you could sit in the library and figure out how to get to get through a screwed system. And that's what I was doing. I wasn't going to sit there and wait for the little girl to social service office to figure out how to do her fucking job. I was in a hurry, but no matter how hard I tried, it, it took a while. So I figured out at that point that somebody was issuing these manuals for policies, procedures, and data to these, uh, uh, every housing authority in America. And I knew how to get my hands on that. So the journey continued. <clears throat> I'm going to take a sip of this energy drink <laughs> for a minute. By the way, guys, we're, we're coming near the end, okay? This was not a, uh, intended to be a full HBO episode, okay? Um, we're going to talk about San Francisco. And I know it, boy, boy, boy. So much happened in that city. <laughs> I spent nearly a year there. I arrived and I ended up in a neighborhood... Um, Pretty close to the Greyhound over there. So I took about, I think I had $15 in my name when I arrived in San Francisco. I noticed everybody was very pleasant in that city. You know, I was still pretty young then, too. Very, very pleasant people, uh, at least to me. Um, 
I spent my first night, uh, well, I went and got drunk at a bar, okay? That's what I did with that $15. Uh, <laughs> and then there was nowhere to go, so I ended up sleeping behind a dumpster, quite literally on the black marked uh, tarmac or the road. It stunk like hell, uh, but I had to put myself somewhere. Um, I was more concerned about the other homeless people doing something to me than I was actually being outside. Of course, when you're drinking, uh, the, the concrete doesn't hurt as much. And, of course, inhibition is lost and so on. I spent about a week doing that. Uh, of course, I got a little smarter and figured out where the parks were and other things. I even figured out the MCC and other homeless shelters there, including the Union Missions. So I started taking a rubber net, mats for the night, stuff like that, and getting food. And um, I eventually uh, found my way back into a bar again. But, you know, I was struggling really bad at that point. I think it was six years in. And, uh, man, I drank. Uh, I was not an everyday drinker. I was the kind of guy that went down there and had 40 drinks. And you drank till you passed out. Of course, when you're young, you could drink that much. I don't think I'd had 40, but it was a lot. So I got to tell you, man, uh, I ended up meeting another alcoholic, really, and um, he had an SRO. For those of you who don't know what that in-housing world is, that is a single-room occupancy. Uh, you might find something like that similar to that uh, in New York, San Francisco, uh, Albuquerque, uh, and a few other major cities. It's basically a bedroom with a sink screwed to the wall, and that's it. You have a community bathroom and another broom closet that everybody on the floor uses. Uh, typically, the people that stay in SROs are anywhere from mentally challenged, uh, psychologically challenged, uh, prostitutes, drug leaders, you know, the whole, the whole thing. So he allowed me to stay at his place, I guess, for about uh, eight months. And we survived all of eating junk food from the gas station because San Francisco offered one unique thing. If you're homeless and you can prove you're homeless and it ain't hard. Uh, they give you what they call GA, which is general assistance. And that general assistance is a card with $450 on it. And then the second thing they give you is a bus pass to use the bus, the train, the trolley, and so on. Uh, you got that simply for just being homeless. You didn't need it. There was no other requirement. Uh, so you can see now, understand why so many people, homeless people, ended up in San Francisco. It's because they get that card with all that money on it. If you go to L.A., they all were the same thing, except no but transit pass bus tokens, whatever. But in LA, uh, they offer around 250 in GA or general assistance, and they actually have real rules. Let's also rewind that clock back so long ago. They may not even do that anymore, but they did then. So I went out there and, uh, you know, the one thing I really enjoyed about San Francisco was the beach. It, you know, it wasn't, I didn't go out in the water, but the beaches were neat. Uh, the trolleys, uh, that's the most memorable thing was the trolleys. I enjoyed that immensely. It's what made me sad leaving that city was simply this. You have no chance of ever getting housing. If you're homeless there, they give you a lottery and you're allowed to enter that lottery three times a year. And during those three events in which you can use and get and that that's a lottery to get a fucking homeless shelter bed. OK, not even housing. Uh, you get to stay for three or four nights and then you can reapply and get on a list with about 10,000 people. And so you if you become homeless in San Francisco you will remain 95% of the time sleeping in the park and other places because there are no rooms really in the shelter. Shelters are really designed to house you possibly 9 to 12 days out of the year. That is it. Okay? So that's why I warn a lot of you guys. You do not want to reach the point where you're at that because once you lose everything, your job, your ability to take a shower, stay clean, and look like you're sane makes it much harder to exit homelessness. Okay? Um. Beyond the San Francisco, so that kind of shows you the whole horseshoe. I repeated that process more than once. I, I can't mentally remember if it was three times, but I do know this. I think on my last, very, very last trip, uh, I became super ill, and uh, I was a, that was exactly about uh, nine, nine and a half years. Okay, uh, at that point, I became sick, and uh, my you know, you get older too, as well. You know, I wasn't I wasn't 26 anymore. I was 36. I'm sorry, not 36. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was 26, not 36. But um, so I I struggled. I became very ill, and again, I almost died out there. I had an infection, a very serious infection, and um, 
that was the day I called it quits because I ended up going to the ER. I stopped breathing and a bunch of other shit happened. And it took me nearly a month to get out of the hospital. And at that point, I just realized that I just wasted a decade of my life for the pure glory of hopping trains and buses for bullshit. But there was one thing won through all of that, okay? Through all that adversity, meeting all those people in all those cities, uh, from surviving sheer heat, uh, you know, from California to damn near freezing to death in Chicago to almost being stabbed to death in New Orleans, burnt a lot, almost burned alive in Memphis. Uh, uh, but, you know, the, the lesson was learned is I could have simply at any point, you know, just decided to research Section 8 on my own without ever leaving Louisiana. It was completely unnecessary. Today, these days, I look back even on my credit report and you see this big blank for a decade. I often wonder if Social Security thought I had died. <laughs> but I did reappear to purchase a home. So um, so that, that kind of does conclude that story. But, you know, the moral here is the real moral of what what exactly gives me the right to sit here on YouTube and on Google and with section eight consulting.com that I own, what gives me that right? I have the right because I walked across this country for 10 years. I have that right because I risk my life through virtue of being stupid. I have that right because I know it better than your social worker, your counselor and all the suits and ties and HUD. I know it because I walked through 15 to 20 different libraries in 13 states, and I researched an unfathomable amount of uh, policies and procedures. I fought HUD itself. I fought housing authorities myself and compelled them under federal law to give me their manuals, to give me their data, to give me their procedures. And one by one, I read through pretty much, if we in total, I think over a million pages, which is a conclusion of what? 13,000 manuals. Is that achievable? Absolutely. You take that stretch of that 10 years, you add it to the next 25, you see where we are today. So what do I really know about what I'm talking about? Let's put it to you this way. You can take those people that just got elected, uh, put in politically into HUD. I can go head to head with them any day. The difference between me and them is they understand what they read out of their manuals, right? Because you think that HUD creates these policies. They don't. Uh, all this stuff was underwritten by college graduates, okay? That stuff's turned over, and then it, at some point becomes part of the uh, title and regulation or federal regulation. So to get back to the real point here, what makes me know it? Because I do know all of it. Um, the only difference is that every four years, I have to find better ways to to be able to consume vast amounts of information, to step back from that big ball of information and just focus on what's good, what's just good enough to use in order to compel my client, you, you guys, to be able to get what you need specifically from a specific housing authority. Making videos about what you're doing at a housing authority in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, ain't going to do shit for the rest of this country. Every single county has a different housing authority and they set the tone and rules, okay? So everything requires research. That's that's what gives me the right. I've already walked the 10 miles. I've already read everything that there is, needs to be ever written about this. Uh, I have tested the theory on unwilling victims in the beginning. I have to say a few of my first clients were less than thrilled uh, with the outcome. But testing, you know. Now, here we are. Here we are, 2021, okay? This isn't 1995 anymore, okay? You see the difference? So the difference now is I know what my success rate is. It's 93%, and not even this fucking pandemic has been able to twist that up. It's made me work harder. It's made my clients crazier to get what they need from me, but it hasn't changed anything. Um, so a lifetime of doing this. Now, going back the seven years on YouTube and a 20 year career doing this, I've got to tell you guys, you know, as I've always said in many of my videos, for 14 of those 20, I didn't charge people anything. I did it surely because of my pure hate. Okay. I think that's the appropriate word the pure hate for the system, not the people working at the housing authority, the hate for the system and how it abuses people. The fact that people 
don't understand how to unravel all the things that are required, why they're being cheated out of housing, and why we deal with a system that the people that are in charge of the system often abuse the hell out of it for their own personal gain, okay? And as you've also heard me say in many of these videos, one of the things that I do very well is I parallel exactly what a really good attorney does. You remember O.J. Simpson and all that? Now, I don't know if the man's guilty or not. It makes no difference to me. But he had a rock star number of lawyers behind him, didn't he? And what was what was the ending result? If you can't, you, you <laughs> he sure he sure the hell did not get convicted of you know, that thing. Thing about it is, those attorneys understood one thing: if you can find every fucking loophole in this stuff, if you can do the research, the time, and figure out how the system works, then you can change the system. So that's what I do: I change the system to make it work for our clients. Okay, it's not about selling vouchers filling out applications and all that. It's understanding truly the reasons why they would want to grant the voucher and then giving you that advantage where you would have a better set of answers than the other 2,000 people that walked in with no advice, with no idea of how the system worked. And you're hoping on your goodwill and charity and your sad story that, that that's going to be giving you a voucher when that's not reality. So... I hope y'all have enjoyed uh, part of that story. I know I went through it quick, but, but you know, the thing about it is, I, you know, I'd never wanted to tell this, uh, in, any of that. Uh, I, I thought about it for three years. That's why I'm not going to dig deep in that. I just, I think it's appropriate to understand how far and how long, but I don't feel compelled to, to go back in those times. Those were dark times. It'd be dark times for anybody. But that's exactly why when I have a client that's home starts talking shit to me on the phone, I can sit there and I can think to myself, honey, you haven't until you walk around with one flip flop and not two and you got nowhere, then you have, you don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. So I deal with clients all the time that are argumentative. They think they've got all the answers, but look, uh, you don't. And that's the thing, you know, like I've always mentioned, a lot of you guys, you do something in your life. You might be doing craps. You might be working. You might be a doctor. You might be a lawyer. Do what you're great at. Let me do what I'm great at. <clears throat> The difference between greatness of doing something is going to be your passion, and I'm passionate about it. I love to win. <laughs> I immensely enjoy defeating the system, and uh, because it gives me such a thrill, and it does. If, if this was just a job to me, then I would just hate it, right? It's not just a job. I'm quite passionate about actually winning this because I like to shove this shit right, shove it right in their mouth because it helps me get my clients what they need. And so because I enjoy that immensely, that's why I'll always continue to do it. But I only do it on a limited basis. So about the cats. At the beginning of the story, I said that I would tell you all about the cats and why they're so important to me and why I bring them up so much. It could have been, it could have easily been a Section 8 channel with a guy that had a parallel with dogs or birds or snakes or spiders. Who knows? There was that second time when I told you all that I was out there during that 10 years on those streets and I was so sick. I was not even living in a house. I was literally living on a strip of dirty carpet that was slid under the fucking house, okay? It was cold. I would say probably in the 30s and 40s. I had pneumonia. I could not eat. I had not drank water and could barely stay conscious. The only thing that showed any regards to me being alive or anything was just one thing. It was a cat. And it was probably the only reason that I hadn't given up and just type, taken my last breath that particular day. That cat would come around. It stayed with me. It kept nudging me in the face. And it came out day after day after day while I suffered. And eventually, I got up the courage, really just the will and the strength, to barely, barely get myself to a hospital where I was able to contact my family and say that, you know, look, I'm near death and I've had enough. I'm done with all of this. The journey, the experiment, um, the bad decision is over with. It's not worth my life. Uh, that cat uh, remained with me in heart and in mind because it was when you're facing the last thing you ever probably think you're going to see is a cat that cared enough to keep you company, to keep you warm, and to keep coming back, to keep, for some reason, keep waking me up. Because I would have just simply gone quietly, you know. 
At that point, I had no energy, nothing left. That was the only thing. So, I guess as a, a token of my appreciation, sorry, having a little drink of this, uh, <laughs> As a token of my appreciation for saving my life, I've given a great deal to all the cats that I could possibly save. And as I'd mentioned many times throughout my videos about these cats, it could have easily been dogs, snakes, rats, and roaches. You know, anything but have kept me company that day would have been a friend to me. It amazed me that uh, I would have ended up leaving the world without ever seeing a human. Because a cat gave a, better, a bigger shit about me than the people that all promised something about housing, promised about food and shelter, but none of those fucking people did a thing. But it showed me kindness. So I remembered that. And to this day, I spend my time and money uh, rescuing abused animals that are abandoned, seriously hurt, injured, you know, abused and whatever it may be. And I'm okay with that, you know. And I solicit a lot of y'all uh, sometimes to become members of my channel because that few dollars that you, the loose change in your couch and your dryer, that loose change that set set on the seat of your car, I use that money whenever y'all donate it through memberships uh, for the health and benefit of these cats who are further ingratiated that somebody cared. Because the fact is, most of them would have never been hurt or injured like this if people simply cared. Isn't that a very interesting parallel? So... It is what it is. Anyways, I want to give y'all something real quick. <laughs> this is... <clears throat> Bear with me, folks. This, this is a channel membership, okay? It makes no difference. I don't, I don't expect any of y'all to pay for my penance of life. But if you want to become a member of the channel, there are certain benefits. One, I'm going to appreciate you doing that. Two, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, well, no, I can't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's just say the memberships are very cheap or inexpensive, okay? And uh, if you get one at the end of the month, Google, uh, YouTube will actually email you say, hey, do you want to continue to support this guy or do you want to stop doing the payment? So they, it's not like Netflix. It'll just keep charging your card, okay? They'll let you all know that. YouTube's probably one of the last honest companies. Well, I'm not going to say company. When it comes to this, they're honest. I don't know about the rest. So those memberships matter to me, okay? And so you know what? I've spent... 200 to 300 videos trying to help all y'all. The only thing I'm asking from y'all is to help these cats. You see, you see the point here? How much of my personal time, all this equipment, $400 speakers, lights, years of my life helping people answer questions and get them housing. And all I'm asking uh, is for some of y'all to consider a membership. If you don't like memberships uh, in the live chat, as you see people commenting, there is a um, dollar sign there. Show your support for Section 8 Consulting. It allows you to uh, donate anything. You could do you could donate a nickel. It makes no difference. So I'm just making you aware of that. Again, I'm not soliciting anything from anybody, and this is not a charity, okay? <laughs> all right, guys, let's talk about Section 8, and I'm going to start answering some of these questions here. First of all, I want to say thank you, Richard Holtz. Thank you for the $2. That will be used for the uh, health benefit and enrichment of these cats that I have. Um I know this year I'm going to start uh, rehoming uh, these cats, some of them. We'll be keeping uh, Big Pops, and uh, we'll be keeping Blue Eyes, which is my Siamese. Five of them that I am keeping. The others, I believe, are fully prepared. And I've got two that I'm also keeping as well because they're simply too damaged to ever uh, to be rehomed. In other words, I don't think that anybody else could acquire their trust. And so sometimes the damage is just too done. So they will be in my care. Uh, well, you know, for as long as they need till they have to go. So if you're interested in membership, there's a link for that. <clears throat> so let me take on these comments real quick. Uh, Sonia Grinstep says, hey, do you ever think of consider writing a book? Uh, no, I'm not considered it because I got to tell you, I don't think I deserve to write a book because I made a very poor decision to, to be out there. I didn't make the initial decision to be homeless, but uh, there was a big cost to that, and it almost cost me my life, you know. And I wasn't out there on a, on a venture to find housing initially, which means I was just out there uh, to risk my life. Uh, it was incredibly stupid what I did, and I don't think that there's anything that can be really learned by that. However, the result of all that culminated time of living on the streets for 10 years um, – did produce the man that I am today, you know, uh, and what I, you know, what I'm good at. That was the only thing that ever good came out of that. 
that 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 in my uh, my need to assist cats <laughs> and you and you folks. So, um, Didi says homeless in New York. New York's a tough place, man, to be homeless. Okay, you got a lot of social organizations like um, San Francisco, but I got to tell you, Didi, uh, if you can survive that, uh, you 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 definitely. Uh, yeah, my kudos, man, uh, because that's New York is not a joke when it comes to that stuff. So I, I, y'all have towers of shelters that are like literal homeless towers, you know, and uh, I've heard how shitty the system is and how hard it is to get out. So, uh, Michelle Hurt, I am currently homeless. I'm sorry to hear that, Michelle. Um, if you ever want to exit that and you're willing to do whatever it takes to do so, um, I have rescued countless hundreds of people from the street, Okay. I'm not talking about people that just lost their apartment and became home. I'm talking about people that went out there and got stuck and did what I did. And uh, I found my way out. I just took a really long time to do so. I understand the system. I know the pain and I know all the traps of being out there. There's so many things that can happen to you when you're on the street. And the loss of inhibition and hope are some of those things that can happen to you. Uh, Paula Bear, uh, Paula uh, Beeler. <laughs> She, she gave me a clap and a smiley face. Appreciate you. Uh, anyways, bravo. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, anyways, Didi, the system sucks in this country. Yep. That's why I'm the unsucker. <laughs> if it sucks, I'm going to suck it. So what I'm saying there is, man, look, I don't give housing authorities a break. I, it's no joke to me, man. I, nothing gives me more than light them up and, and get what I want. It's like a robber in the night, you know? And my goal is to basically break the doorknob off, take what I want, get it for my client, and then leave. You know, if the, if you leave a hole, anything I can exploit, I'm going to get it. Okay, within the within the realm of what's legally available to me, and I've learned a lot. You know, what's interesting is it kept as I learned more about housing authority, their operations and procedures, and the purposes behind all the different vouchers and the executive decisions they make in which to give it to people. I also learned by virtue of dealing with hundreds of these housing authorities. So you start to build a map, kind of like AI. You start to see a pattern in the system. And then before long, you start to see where the system is weak. And uh, once you see that there's a weakness, it's like it's like a parade, man. It's like a party. One, let me tell you something. I, I'll intentionally look for housing authorities that have weaknesses in their system because, first of all, if it was designed to be fair, people would already have housing. They'd already have a voucher. So I don't really feel like, um, I don't really feel that guilty uh, about taking advantage of a system. It's sad that most people don't understand how it really does work, but that's a reality. We can't all understand everything there is to do with Section 8. But if you don't know, and some, if you got a, somebody you can uh, talk to about it, that's usually the best thing. Before me, there was nobody out there that helped anybody with Section 8. The best you could get was a caseworker, a social worker, and they could assist you with writing your name, your address, and so on, an application for a housing authority voucher, and then it was left to luck, okay? Nobody's taken it to the depth and level that I have in this nation, period. Um, nobody that I can think of. I can't think of any parallels. Now, there's a lot of good talkers, you know, out there that uh, understand the political end of it, but politics don't get vouchers. You know, sharp uh, wingtip shoes and bullshit rolling out your mouth and eyewitness news does not get people vouchers. Understanding the system does. You know, like I mentioned, you guys, even if you had a housing authority employee in your pocket, they would only be as good to you as if, if they actually were living in the city you're in. I've seen housing authority employees go rogue on YouTube, give out all the good stuff, all the goodies on YouTube. But the problem with that is they only have experience with the housing authority they dealt with. Their, their advice is, is virtually useless in the next county. So how do I differentiate? I'm sitting here dealing with all 50 states and every housing authority that's ever had an address. And so you see the point. I've seen it all, and I've dealt with them all, and so I'm able to deal with it case by case. I'm not just experienced with working in one little town, one little housing authority with one set of operations. Um, but yeah, um, Harold Powell, I got to roll down, roll down the chat here. <clears throat> Anyways, you cracked me up with the one flip flop. Oh yeah, part of that story. I like using that one flip flop thing, man. You know what? That's a true story. 
things got so shitty one day out in Denver while I was out there, didn't have any money that I would literally, and then it occurred to me if I wore one flip flop that people would give me more money. So yeah. Uh, so don't think that the homeless people don't play on y'all's emotions. Uh, you know, like I said, it was a long time ago, but yeah, I wore one flip flop. I tell you what, that was a real heart tugger, wasn't it? So everybody in traffic was ready to flick a nickel out the window to me. Just wear one flip flop. That really just grabs their ass when you're young. <laughs> Look, don't go out there and defraud people in the traffic just because you need to pay your light bill. I'm just saying that was some shit that happened a long time ago when I was homeless. Yes, one flip flop. Uh, Harold Powell, uh, when you have a reevaluation, you have to resubmit paperwork every year, every year for your finances expenses. And then the second part of what you're saying is there is a lot of papers that must be submitted. Otherwise, you could lose your voucher. So I believe that what Harold Her Powell is uh, discussing with us currently is what they call recertification once a year. But please also be apprised, people, if you do obtain a voucher, you utilize that voucher to live in a subsidy property, low-income property, wherever, uh, that any time your income changes, you must report that it within the first 30 days, 30 days of that change. In other words, under federal regulation, you must report it immediately. If you exceed the 30 days, the housing authority catches that, then they have every right to say that you have now violated the HOP contract. They don't typically use that as a weapon against people, but those of you that continually complain about a lot of shit and call the housing authority every day, or you email and you have an attitude with those workers, they will notate that specific thing as an elimination part for you. So you I always tell people, man, always make sure that you're on the up and up when using these vouchers because it's not they're not going to notify you that you've done something. They're going to wait till they really need to get rid of you. Okay? They think of it more of it as a, a rainy day. Let's get rid of Bob. So I caution you guys to always make sure that you're reporting your changes as they change uh, every 30 days, if possible, if nothing's changed. But he's right. Recertification once a year. Uh, but that's not a lifesaver. It really should be as often as you. Life does change. Qu Quite T, that's absolutely true. Uh, Quite T says Bucks County housing uh, sucks badly. Man, I, you know what? Uh, let's go back to that housing authority conversation. How many of you guys have uh, emailed, have written me, have flown planes over with managers and said, you know what? The housing, there's nothing but good, honest Christian folks working in the housing authority. You know what? I'm going to sell my home and leave them all my assets. Uh, I would like to put them on uh, Channel 9, and I would like to thank the housing authority for completely fucking my life up. I don't know anybody on the YouTube channel or anybody that I've ever experienced that appreciated a damn thing the housing authority does. Why? Because they don't really do much, do they? So I do agree with you, Quiet T. Um, <clears throat> that's actually, uh, you're actually being a gentleman by saying the housing authority sucks. Uh I get about 2,000 emails a week, and I just don't see any great comments about housing authorities. Their image is already damaged. It's like, um, I don't know, uh, housing authorities more like the county jail. I would say that the officers at the county jail have about the same reputation as the housing authority. Look, when you decide to help people and be honest with them, when you actually take your job at the housing authority seriously, you mean dust off that manual and earn your fucking paycheck at that point? Maybe the people in the U.S. or in your county and your state will start to trust you. But until then, you're just you're doing nothing but deceiving people. That's the point of the housing authority, you know. And, I, and another thing that really mystifies me is why they call it the housing authority, because the reality is they have no fucking authority, uh, other than the fact that they control your situation and whether or not they have an authority to issue a voucher. That's about it. <clears throat> Pretty clever game, wouldn't you say? <laughs> so, guys, um, talking about the homelessness, uh, you know, that 10 years. And for those of you that came in late, uh, that was a cross in the U.S., across 22 states, living in 13 states, 8,400 miles traveled, near death twice. <laughs> That's a lot of time to spend, man. Uh, and I've seen it. I've done it. I've walked a mile. I've walked a hundred miles, you know, uh, these days, uh, you know, I live in my own home and do my own thing. I'm not, so I'm not, you know what? I'm, I'm lucky because a lot of people will never leave the street. Some, you know, there's a lot of people out there that 
they don't have a high IQ and things like that, and or they don't have the motivation, or they suffer from other issues, and may never leave. And th those are people that I constantly try to, to rescue because if if somebody doesn't try to help these people, okay, whether they be homeless or extra extraordinarily low income, then who the hell will? If we're not unwilling to help uh, people that are homeless and disabled, homeless and senior, homeless and uh, with a family. Uh, you know, I was telling you about a family in New York, 12, 12 of them. I had to rescue a family of 12. In total, these were 14 people living in three tents in the woods. Okay? Pandemic produced it. What was the housing authority's answer to, to them? Go fuck yourself. That's what the housing authority, that was their answer to that family. They knew good and well that those people were living in the fucking woods, but they're too busy giving out vouchers like gift cards to their friends and family and the fucking lawn man. They're not worried about the family and children that are living in the woods. Just like that, a senior couple I was telling you about a rescue out of a shelter because they had so many medical problems, they almost died in there. The shelter's only goal was to make sure that that elderly couple had a toilet brush to scrub their fucking toilet. In other words, the old seniors living there with all those health problems, the shelter only viewed them as an instrument to scrub their fucking toilet or they can get out. This is the kind of shit that I deal with every day. These are the appalling conditions that a lot of you don't even see. That's why when you come on this YouTube channel, well, maybe, maybe it'd just be better off being homeless. You don't want to do that. Trust me. You don't want to do it. Because it won't just change the core of what you are, what you do. It'll change you forever. And you're risking a lot, uh, both up here and physically. You can lose your life. And the other people out there that are intent on being homeless can kill you. They can do lots of things to you. So I'm going to warn you guys. If you really want to get your housing situation straight, not hire a fucking consultant or you can spend 20 years researching. I don't know what to tell you in that, in that end. But get serious about it. It's a serious issue today. But that's what I'm talking about, you know, and then uh, let's talk about three months ago. I told you a woman was stabbed 17 times. They kicked her out of the hospital. What was the homeless shelter's answer to that? Well, look, you're too fucking damaged. You can't mop the floor, clean anything. So here's a bologna sandwich and a coupon to fucking McDonald's, you know. That's it. You're useless to us. You've already been stabbed up. We can't possibly use you to scrub the toilets and mop the floors. So you have to get the fuck out of our shelter. This is the kind of shit you're going to contend with. And I dealt with it in all those states. You think any of those shelters in Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Lake Charles, Houston, Oklahoma, Jackson, Mississippi, Atlanta, Memphis, Denver, Chicago, Seattle, Portland, and, and uh, San Francisco. You think those people, when you walk in the door to get a bologna sandwich, give a shit about whether or not you get housing, you're a federal number to them. And when you're there, if you're not going to clean and do whatever it is they want you to do, and follow what absurd rules they want, then your ass is out, okay? You guys have this all messed up. And you think that one woman that's got 900 cases that just got her degree out the bubble gum machine is going to help you get housing at the, at the shelter? You're out of your fucking mind. I'm just letting you know. If you haven't seen that yet, you're about to get prepared. And then the magic really starts rolling. I've told you all about 211. You give the professionals at 211 a call. Now, they've upped their game a little bit. They used to give you a roll of trash bags, but now they'll give you a roll of trash bags that are scented. That way they smell nice when you pack your shit and live under a bridge. I'm serious. You get scented bags, much fresher and cleaner to smell. And then you will get a voucher, not to a place to live, but you will get a voucher for a rubber mat. You can move into your new rubber mat and the unair conditioned gym. And if you've ever smelled real homeless people, Smelling a person that's homeless, okay, and I'm not suggesting everybody, but somebody that's not taking a shower for a month is one thing. But when they take off the clothes, you smell nothing but foot and booty, okay? It'd be a lot like you sleeping with the dead, somebody that's putrefied for about two weeks. So anytime you guys want to challenge the concept of, oh, fuck it, I'd just rather just be homeless and deal with this, or I don't have enough money, coins in my purse to figure out my housing, you have no idea what world you're fixing to walk into. And some of these people that are on my channel are homeless, and they know they'll be the first one to tell you. So I hold no apologies for the <laughs> profanities. I, I like it to be crystal clear. You know, I like it to be crystal clear. It does describe the intensity of what you'll face uh, as a homeless person. 
and that, uh, you know, a lot of these websites, uh, oh, we help the home. No, they don't really, you know, they don't do what you quite think they do. After everything's been donated, all the lovely shit gets, what, sold? And then all the trash is given to the homeless people right after they kick them out the door, you know? I can tell you a lot about shelters and the system and why nobody actually ever leaves the street because of it. And it really does anger me. So what I said in the beginning of the video, through the virtue of adversity, struggling, and anger, did I learn the system and learn to defeat it? I was not fucking joking whatsoever about that. So you have, you have options, folks. If you want to be able to get a Section 8 voucher, get into affordable housing, and so on, your options are out here are pretty slim pickings. We don't have that many housing authorities open. They some of them have emergency vouchers, some have vouchers. You can take your advice from Google. You can take your advice from some random people off Google, or you can take it from me. I get the job done, okay? I don't have anything to prove. Even with the reviews, I think there's a link for that down there. There's over 100 of them. People leave those like candy. Look, if I didn't produce results, 50 people would not be sitting in a live video listening to what I have to say and so on. So that's that's what I'm going to tell you, guys. You all have to get serious. We're rolling into the... Um, Holiday season. A lot of you guys have not squared away your housing. A lot of you are in court battling evictions and so on. You need to get your shit straightened out because what's going to happen in the year? Money runs out. Federal funding runs out. State funding runs out. It's the end of the budget. And so you're going to find that trying to get vouchers and deal with housing authorities has become a very perilous mission. And I got to tell you something. Nobody wants to ring in the new year knowing that their ass is going to be put out in three days. Okay. So I'm just telling you guys, if you really are serious about getting housing and you're able to work with me, then I can usually get y'all a situation. You may not be living in the same county, okay? Sometimes you have to give that up. Sometimes you have to move one or two counties over. But if it achieves the goal of you getting a voucher and you can survive just 12 single months in one county, then I can port you right back to wherever you came from, you know? That's the thing. You guys have to make sacrifices. You're not in the position to shop around and get what you want. This is not Burger King. You don't get it your way anymore. When you intersect the world of Section 8, there is a lot of shit in federal regulation and rules and policy in Title 24, top by housing authority, their policies, procedures, and data manual. And look, you either tell those people on the application specifically the preferential things that they want, or you get nothing but a very exceptionally long way. I had a lady comment on a YouTube um, channel. Well, I don't understand. I live in Houston and I'm still on the list 15 years later. You know what that tells me that you wrote on there? I am low income. My name is Sally. Please give me voucher. So they put her ass right at the end and she will remain at the bottom of nowhere, straight to hell. Look, I don't have any clients that waited more than three years to get a voucher in the city of Houston. But did she ask me for help? No. She came to my channel to moan about some shit. Okay? So we have our moaners and tire kickers, and we got people want to do something. Let's sit there for 15 years. I'm not even convinced she's even on the housing authority. They probably purged her back in 1981. She's still just under the delusion she's waiting. That's another thing, guys. If you haven't heard from the housing authority and recertified in a year, you're done. That's called purging. They purged you. When you, when you were sitting there in the shower shampooing your hair and you had the radio plan and you said fuck it turn the phone on i want to hear it ring that was the day the housing authority called for recertification you missed it unfortunately they pressed f12 and you're gone you're no longer part of the house they just cleared the spot they don't play around and look it, housing authorities have gotten even more clever they will actually try to send uh notices to old addresses knowing damn well you updated your address they'll mail it to the old one. Oh well looks like we got 600 suckers we sent them we sent out the notices to their old addresses. Only about six were managed to figure out we did that, but we were able to purge the rest. And they're so happy. They probably uh, blow up balloons and have a party with champagne at the house. Like, hey, we, we purged 600 suckers because they couldn't answer the fucking phone. You guys have to take your responsibility very seriously with this. You also need to be able to give the housing authority recertification. Make sure that you're constantly on top of your phone number, your address, and your email. Make sure that Momo, Papa, Aunt, Auntie, Whoever, I'm talking about your cousin in Tibet and on top of a Chinese hill, you need to make sure that application is full of full of ways for, for you to be contacted. And it is your absolute right and responsibility to make contact with the housing authority liberally, maybe every six months and say, 
please tell me what address you have for me. Please tell me what phone number you have on record and verify that shit, okay? If you're waiting for these people to apprise you of your rights, your rules, and other things, that's never going to happen. Unless you, unless you live in one of these states where they're well-funded. And right now, nobody's got any money. The feds have got a flotilla of money coming out, but the problem is, uh, well, you know, politicians need to argue about how they're going to spend that money. And they don't want to give too much to the low-income people. They don't want to get people in a frenzy. So, But i got to tell you this, uh, that, that, that mis- cash, the government cash machine closes at the end of the year. And when it closes, it's going to be a dry, hard ride rough. 2022 the government cash machine is quickly closing guys all these things have been pouring out and giving away look when you ring in the new year you better get your voucher habit in hand i'm not joking about that i warned y'all back last year to react and do things early but a lot of you chose oh well you know things are okay right now right after maybe after i go do yoga and go to church i'll think about getting up and uh those are the same people that are calling me crying now with a scented trash bag because they called 211. And you all know about 211 and 311, how well that goes, right? You get three minutes of consultation with them. That's their idea of a consultation. Now, what's your name? What's your fucking problem? And what do you want? Oh, well, what we're going to do is, do you have an ink pen? Could you write this number down? So you write all these numbers down. And when you call them, we're sorry. The number you're trying to call is not no longer really present. You call the next one. Beep. We're sorry. The number's disconnected in, back in 1981. Please try a different number. Beep. And you keep going. It's a u- absolutely fucking useless service. So that's your option. You can do a, you can do it your way. You can do it through the social worker, the, the, the case worker. You can do it through me. Or you can call 211. We all know what that's going to do. Look, if you didn't have a drinking problem before you call 211, you might have one after you deal with them five times. I don't know anybody that's gotten a voucher from ever calling 211. Do you know that 211 is control almost half of all the vouchers issued? But yet, magically, vouchers never get issued. So I don't know. Maybe they're actually framing them on the wall. I don't know. They might use them as toilet paper in the building. I've not yet seen anybody actually get one from 211. So... <clears throat> we'll take on a few questions here and see what's happening. Uh, uh, Ms. Napier, what is the best place to take a, what's the best place to take take my voucher? Well, uh, to answer that question, I really don't know what state you're living in. So I don't know a lot about your case, what's going on. Uh, Harold Powell says he agree. Quiet T says you're so right. Harold Powell, yes, he's certainly right. DD bags and free breeze. Yes, there's nothing more lovely uh, than a night's rest with a scented trash bag under the bridge because you failed to get a voucher. You know, and I didn't get scented bags while I was out there, unfortunately. All I had was dollar store bags. Sometimes I had to wash out dirty bags to make them clean bags. So, you know, <laughs> you know, go down to Popeye's asking for a free chicken wing and also a bag. That will be your new suitcase traveling the country. There's nothing like traveling with a Popeye's bag. Nobody ever steals your luggage except for other homeless people. That's what's so strange. I always watch the homeless rob the homeless. Do you think the other fucking person has anything in that bag? Then why are you stealing it? Stop the bullshit. Um, you work in all 50 states. Well, HUD's in all 50 states. Housing authorities are in all 50 states, and they're also in all 5,500 counties. So I would, I would agree. Yes, I do work in all 50 states. I have clients in all 50 states, including Hawaii and Puerto Rico, and I've challenged over 300 housing authorities. Easily 300. Um, can I name them off? No, I'm not going to do that. But yeah, 300 easily. Um, so yes, the, to that question, you help with getting a voucher in New York. Yes. Well, uh, you know, as I've always mentioned about New York, they're 40 percent of my clients. 30 percent of my clients are L.A. in the California area. And then the rest of my clients are around the nation. The only other significant numbers are coming out of New Jersey and Florida. New Jersey, uh, tough. Florida, uh, uh, tough state. Period. It's always been tough. It was tough before it was even a tough time. Florida is purely a political state, and it don't like giving anybody anything out there unless you're rich and you're white. Okay? So let's just be straight up fucking honest. Florida is not the place for anybody unless you're old and you're white. I battled that system over there, and I have to say, in principle, they're probably one of the most racist systems I've ever seen to anybody. Okay, so let's just be straight up because I'm not the kind I'm not the type of guy that, <clears throat> I'm not gonna lie to you. 
So it is what it is. Florida is just not uh, not happening, in my opinion. If it was up to me, I would move everybody out of Florida. I think Florida needs to rethink. Okay, I think that Florida is great about a lot of things. Okay, I think Florida gets it right. A lot of things are right. But one thing they don't get right is that old Southern attitude. I've got the same fucking problem with Atlanta, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. That old Southern bullshit needs to stop. Okay? These, these states tend to think they're running their own private nation and treating people like they're trash, and I don't agree with that. As a matter of fact, I don't agree, but I fight it. So you guys out there, if you're, if you're experiencing discrimination in any form, against your age, your color, if they're trying to bigot you because you're gay or you're homosexual, you're lesbian, you let me know. That's the kind of shit I'm willing to fight for. That's the kind of stuff that needs to be corrected. This is not 1920 no more. And we, we nobody's going to be happy. Let me tell you something. The only way they get away with that shit is because people are too damn scared to give up. They're worried they're going to lose their voucher or they won't get one because of it. Well, that's not true. Uh, the thing is, we got to get rid of people that do shit like that in these housing authorities because they don't need to be operated like some private corporation we're the only people that ever get a voucher are friends and family. That shit needs to stop. You know, Marissa Fudge that runs the Housing Authority, HUD, Department of Urban Development and Indian Affairs. And I want to express Indian Affairs because I want to make it very clear if you're part of an Indian nation or you're part of Hawaii or you live out in Arizona, Louisiana, so on, where you have tribal nations and other things, Section 8 was originally designed for you. It was not for the white folks, the black folks, the Asian folks, and all that. It was originally designed for Indians. Well, we know what we did in this nation to those Indians. So, back in the day, here we go again. So, but anyways, um, <clears throat> Francine Timothy became a member. I appreciate that. She is now an amethyst. I'll be using that membership fee. <clears throat> I can guarantee you that will go into buying treats because uh, me and I have to purchase some today. Let me tell you something. You know, you go buy a 30, uh, 30 ounce uh, box of cat treats for those of you who've got cats or a dog. When you got 22 cats, can you even fathom the bill to do that? Okay. So five cats can burn up 30 ounces in a week. Okay. 22 cats, do the math. Four containers. That's $100 a week. It's $400 a month just the treats. That's not talking about food. Okay. It's not a joke. So, you know why it's expensive keeping cats. Matter of fact, that one I was talking about the other day, uh, <clears throat> Little Pops, uh, it took me, I think it around $1,800 liberally to save that cat's life. Okay. We went through a lot, but I had a decision. You know, I could have gone down. Look, look, guys, I could have gone down and got that 65 inch TV, and then I would have had a little bowl of fur and bones in my back lawn. That's something great to feel really good about. Hey, man, got a new TV. Oh, by the way, could you go and kick that kitty fur and bone in the hole? Because I'm so fucking self-centered. The only thing I can think about is improving my little bullshit reality. I don't have time to help anything else that breathes or lives. So I was to be real with you, man. Yeah, I spent the money on that. I could give a damn about the TV. It's the same thing. So if I'm willing to focus my attention on helping people out here that are dying to get housing, that are elderly, that are disabled, that are young, that are domestic violence victims, that are people that uh, are dying of HIV or AIDS, okay, whether it's their cause or if it happened uh, incidentally. If I'm willing to care that much about a cat, then I do actually do care about what happens to people I talk to because I talk to people every day. So stories do matter. It's only it's only when we reach that point where I have some clients that will try to manipulate me by virtue of knowing my videos. Uh, some people just, they, they're on the edge and they feel it's necessary. Look, guys, y'all never have to beg me to help you, ever. I have never have. I spent my first hundred videos and tens of thousands of hours on a telephone that nobody paid for and then get paid one red nickel, not a wooden nickel, not a copper penny for years to help. Okay. I never once got on a video and solicited anybody. Hey man, look, I need you. I need a credit card number. You're not going to get housing. Okay. Never did that. 
I do charge these states. <laughs> Look, man, pandemics made things much tougher. I don't think a lot of you guys realize when you got me working on a case. Oh yeah, I paid for uh, I paid for the twenty minutes and so on, and then I end up having to work another six hours personally. You know, so I get up in the middle of the night and I'm thinking about Mary Kay and her house and whether or not I'm going to have to a say, well, you know, Mary, thank you for the money for the consult. Unfortunately, we're out of talk time, so I guess you're just going to need a bag of fresh scented uh, trash bags because I will no longer be able to help you. Instead, I do get up in the middle of the night, and whenever brilliance does hit into mine, and I think of a particular loophole or a, a way to exploit or get what I need for my client, then I work on that case in the middle of the night. A lot of my best thinking happens in the morning, and that's when I get a lot done for a lot of you guys. So you don't ever really just pay for 20 minutes. What y'all really do pay for is hours and hours of my time. You just don't see and understand that. That's what a lot of you guys don't get. It never just stops at a conversation. It never stops there. You know, some some of you guys tell me stories that, uh, that have left me in tears. Some of you uh, made it impossible to sleep some nights. It's not, it's not y'all's problem. It's mine. I shouldn't, I should have never gotten involved. If I couldn't handle it, you know, and there are some immensely uh, tough days mentally uh, because some cases will grab at your heart to a point where it, it checks, it checks your reality. It makes you question every part of the moral and, and the ethic side of you as to whether or not you would actually abandon that person or help them with every cause and strength you have, despite them not having any money. So, no, this has never been a business for me. A lot of you guys call, oh, well, how's your business going? This ain't no fucking business. Look, I own two companies. I don't need to own Section 8 Consulting as a form of payment. I do five consults a day, every other day. That's 20 a week. This is not a 10-hour job for me. It is not a job whatsoever. I do it only to help. I do get compensated because I believe that is reasonable, okay? Because I can't allow it to consume my life as well. I've done as much as I can. The reality is there needs to be more me uh, out there, more people willing to spend time on this to help others. Uh, Marba Newell, I appreciate the $19.99. So that that is greatly appreciated and will be used for the care and comfort of these cats. By the way, guys, I want to mention that uh, on, um, let's see, October... 24th, which is a Sunday, we're going to be doing a video specifically about the cats. We're going to meet as many as we can. Let's bear in mind that some cats cannot be picked up, okay? I'm not going to get shredded like cheese, okay? Some of these cats are damaged, and so when you pick them up, they will absolutely claw you to death, okay? So I'll show you the cats that I can, and even the cats that I can show you all, Look, cats are not like dogs. They don't want to be coddled, okay, which means you get a few seconds to see them. So I hope you all watch carefully. Uh, I've got some other, some of my cats are rather lethal. In other words, if I were to do that just for the purpose of the video, I would have. what I would do was damage the trust that has taken me a year to two years to get from some of these cats that have been abused, lit on fire, that have been shot by guns, pellets, and BBs from obnoxious children, you have no idea what some of these cats have been through. Some of the same shit that some of you humans have been through. I, you know what? There's no difference between the morality and the ethics of loving a person and wanting to help them and there is an animal. You know, they've got a brain, a heart, they got a soul, they care, they care about you, you care about them. I really don't see the distinguishing factor. Uh, we just, uh, we're just smart enough. And if you're smart enough to be the, the top of the food chain, then it's your absolute responsibility to care for other things. And that also includes elderly, okay, and children and babies and animals and pets, okay? That's an absolute responsibility. I think it should be a responsibility from birth. So, uh, DD, I appreciate the $4.99. Uh, as you know, that's going to go towards the Amazon bill. And no, I don't support Amazon, but they have the damn cat treats and they can get them here quick. So, it does help, guys. Look, uh, we spend a lot of money on these cats, uh, but it's, you know what? I'd rather leave this earth, take my last breath and not regret it. Some of you guys won't be able to leave here. When you take your last breath, instead of knowing that you're going to leave this world with a clear conscience, you're going to, you're going to end up having a panic attack in the middle of dying because you know that the life you lived has been nothing but trash and the way that you've dealt with people and animals and other things. And you're going to regret it because, you know, 
some of you guys are just doing the wrong thing. So, but anyways, we don't want to get too deep into that. What I do want to say is this. Look, today's a good day to care. Um, I care about y'all and what happens to y'all, and I think y'all should care about other people. If you find these uh, videos useful, please share it with other people. It's not for my benefit, for theirs, okay? Because a lot of people struggle and don't know how to ask for help. One of my, one of my, uh, let me tell you another story. I got a lot of Jewish people that contact me on the cool because a lot of us are raised, okay, in communities. We may be of a different color, a different race, a different belief, a, a different religion. And sometimes it prevents us from asking for help. But the consequences of not asking for help can be rather serious. And sometimes in my Jewish community, in my Asian community, in my Arab communities, struggle with that. Uh, the others, uh, or my actual Hispanic community, struggles with the concept of asking for help. I live in Houston around people that are Hispanic, that may be from Spain, they could be from South America, or they could be from Mexico, right? Uh, the Mexican people are very proud people. They'll work, they'll work twice as hard as anybody I've ever seen, most in most cases, okay? But they will not ask for help unless they absolutely have to. And I immensely respect that, you know. Uh, and that's not the only race that does that, you know. I, you know what, over uh, about 40% of my clientele is African-American. I have not to this day in 20 years met one African-American, and I mean quite literally a black person. I've never met one in a consulting uh, call that I felt in my mind uh, was lazy or uneventful or had the inability to get housing. In fact, uh, my African-American community is probably the most successful of all to get Section 8 housing because they actually take the advice that I give. My biggest knuckleheads are going to be the Caucasian and the white folks. Y'all guys will argue with me. Sometimes y'all pleasant, sometimes neurotic. Man, I got to tell you, that's my toughest community to deal with, but that's all right. It goes to show that we're all raised differently. We're all taught to think different ways and do different things, but... You know, as an, as an American, uh, I, I serve everybody, <laughs> and I enjoy it immensely. I even have my Russians from New York, New Jersey, Pittsburgh. Believe it or not, my uh, immigrated Russian community, uh, they contact me a lot. I enjoy it because their dialects are so interesting. It actually spices up the conversation, and I love the way they, they think and view Section 8. They see, it's more of a game to them. It's not a game that they needed, okay? And they're not treating it so much as a game, but they see it as a competition that they can win. And it gives them great confidence when I'm giving this consult. So what I'm saying is I do have communities that call me because they feel like that I can help them win. And that's what it is. We, you know, we never had to reach a point where we're dealing with Section 8 and vouchers. It's it's already de-evolved to the point now where it's a competition and it has, we either win or you don't win. And so, yeah, <laughs> All right, a few more comments here. Ashley Elizabeth, amazing work. I appreciate you saying that. Anytime somebody thanks me, I appreciate that. Believe it or not, I don't get thanked very often, and I don't request that anybody do so, okay? I don't live and breathe that. It's not my fuel, but I do certainly appreciate it. Uh, Joey Chaz, I'm going to hell, but I still, still live life to the fullest. There's nothing wrong with that. We make our decisions. Hey, man, when you're born... When when you uh, when you're born and you're you're in that hospital and you come out, there is no uh, there's no government official there that says, "Hey man, look, uh, this is going to be the manual. Welcome to Earth. You live in a bowl that has an atmosphere, and you're going to be living in that uh, that little area with air in it, and we're going to keep you on this rock for approximately I don't know from now to whenever you die. So you'll be living on this one little rock. There are billions and trillions all up in the space." But we're just going to keep you focused on living on this one rock. There will be no operations, man. You're welcome to commit crimes, rape, steal, whatever you need to do. And then you decide whether or not that's an ethical thing to do. We literally arrive on Earth and you either make, uh, you either decide to make, I think a really uh, living life is, uh, is the gift itself. The, uh, that you've been given an advantage to be able to live and whether or not you intend on helping other people uh, along with their journey. And that's what this is. It ain't nothing but a journey, man. Look, in another 40, 50 years, I'll be dead. That was my journey. What did I do with it? Did I just think about me? Did I help other people? You know? So, um, Brittany, uh, Brittany, uh, man, damn it, today's a tough one on names. We'll just call you Brittany. Hey, Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing good today. I'm preaching a little bit. 
We talked about the 10 years, you know, how, how in the hell did I uh, survive 10 years out on the street as a teenager and a, an early adult? How did I cross 22 states, live in 13, managed to almost die twice? What invoked me to, to reach the point that I have with this? You know, uh, what does it take uh, to change the course of a man's life where he would do what I do now? You know, what, what how much does it take? You know, that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about a little bit of morals, a little bit of ethics, a little bit of everything. You know, that's how this channel is. Marva Newell. Uh, yes, keep donating because it's needed. I share your videos with anyone I think would benefit. And I appreciate that. These videos are not designed for the self-enrichment of me. Uh, YouTube pays me approximately on my best month, maybe $1,000. Now, let me tell you something about that. For the vast majority of the survival of this channel, over seven years, I was paid nothing. Uh, so far to date, what it's paid out is only is not even uh, paid for half of the video equipment. In other words, me being on YouTube is an absolute loss and has been since day one. Uh, YouTube will finally become profitable in probably 2028. OK, so for those of you that think I'm here uh, for personal enrichment, I sure as the hell would not pick YouTube making videos as a career. It is not profitable whatsoever. And uh, YouTube has been gracious enough to accept and take 51% of everything I receive. 51%. That's what they get. I think it's 50 or 51%. So, yes, uh, I think I probably have made a career of enriching YouTube. So, <laughs> Leo Lopez. Jay has given us, folks, a lot of information on his videos, and he knows the stuff. God, I hope so, man, because if I have been flip-flopping around for 20 years doing this, and I still don't know, Jack. If I'm asleep at my desk and I really don't know, we're in trouble. And so are about 1,100 people that I've probably helped in the last 12 months. We're in trouble. It means the only thing I do is talk a good game, but yet every single consult book with me is an absolute failure. So, but that's really not the case, is it? Uh, let's take a look here. Haley Nemeth, uh, I believe we are in a giant simulation like uh, someone's Sims game. You know, I've got to say, man, life, life is an interesting thing, man. I mean, you just simply arrive on a planet one day by virtue of birth, right? But there's no manual. Uh, there's no, what the hell? <laughs> you know what makes life so tough? If you if you were on Earth and you were the only one, then there would be no rules, no policies, no procedures, right? It'd just be you. And so there would not be so many problems. It's only when we add other people into our life that things get complicated. Like uh, people that, uh, you know, you're so you're born in the U.S., you have to, you automatically have to follow every rule the minute you're born, just because you're here. You're born on this piece of earth, you know? Uh, so life is an interesting thing. Who knows if it's simulated? Who knows what, you know? I, I know one day when I go, I'll be glad to go. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to try something different, you know? Maybe a different planet. I can do something different, uh, choose a different option maybe, you know? So... All right, guys, I've enjoyed talking with y'all. I think, uh, let's see, where are we at on the time? We're at an hour and 27 minutes. I have rambled and diddlyed and daddled. I hope y'all have enjoyed the uh, short but brief life story of uh, the 10-year journey across the country and uh, the true cause. And uh, one last thing, you know, like I said, it, it was that near-death experience with that cat at the 10th year on the streets. That's why all this is even possible, man. I often think, you know, sometimes when things are really bad, there's usually one good cause why we might stay and one good cause why we might leave. And so I'd have to say that I probably owe that cat in my life. I've never saw it again. But uh, I tell you, he extended uh, what it is to, for me to be here. So, no, I will never uh, stop trying to help people uh, or try to help uh, these, these cats, no matter how crazy they drive me. So, all right, guys, I've enjoyed talking with y'all. Uh, we'll do this again. I think, uh, let's see, what's today? Let's try it again Sunday. Maybe I'll come up with something more interesting to talk about. Um, if any of y'all need assistance with housing, Section 8, low-income housing, so on, I'm going to leave you a link, and then we're going to wrap this up. Let's see here. All right, I'm going to copy this in chat. Of course, they're in the description of the video. You can uh, see different ways to book me. You can look at reviews and all the different things. So so there it is. It should be there. It's a clickable link. Uh, all right, guys, go try to enjoy your weekend. And uh, I got to tell you, man, I'm running out of great ideas about Section 8. In other words, 
when you make two or 300 videos, all I can do now, I've talked about every known factor that's included with Section 8. Think about that, hundreds of videos. I'm now struggling. So we may have to take this YouTube channel in a different direction. What I mean by that is we may need to quite possibly find a new angle to talk about things that would be beneficial. I don't think there's anything after two or 300 videos that I can really add to the subject of talking about Section 8. For those of you who just arrived, it doesn't mean the depth of the channel. It just means that, you know, we're going to have to figure out something more interesting. And I got to tell you, talking about Section 8 every day, every other day, does become a bit burdensome. You know, I enjoy talking with y'all online video, but we, we need more spice uh, in these videos, man. It can't always just be how to get this and how to get that. We got to get more spicy about this, a little bit more intrigue, a little bit more fun. Um, I just, after a while, it just gets old, man. <laughs> if you really want to get a voucher quicker than everybody else, hire me. You don't have to sit here and watch videos all damn day. So, anyways, I'm enjoying talking to y'all. Y'all have a good day. Bye-bye.